Hello, uh, my name is Scott and uh, I live here in uh, Toronto, Canada and uh, wanted to post this video for anybody who's uh, suffering with um, chronic idiopathic urticaria, uh, chronic hives. Um, I've had uh, chronic hives since um, 1997 and uh, really struggled with the condition uh, over that period for sure and um, learned a lot. I've experimented a lot, I've researched a lot, and I've, I've found ways that really work to get me into remission. So I'm at a point now, a uh, couple decades later, where, where I can actually kind of control the hives. And um, I thought it would be really helpful for me to share my story, um, because there, there might be something in there that, uh, that helps you. Uh, so I thought it would be worth um, doing that. So I've prepared a, a few slides and a bit of a, uh, I guess, a presentation that I can show you. A um, couple things to note, though, before I get into it. Number one, I'm like the farthest thing from a doctor. I, I have absolutely no qualifications whatsoever. So take uh, take all of this with a grain of salt. It's it's just um, you know stuff that I've I've found along the way, and and it's things that help me. You know, and everybody's physiology is different. So. Uh, so, you know, take it for what it is. Um, and then uh, the other thing is that uh, I, I'm going to mention a, a few books and, and like products and things like that that I've found helpful. I don't have any commercial relationship with uh, any of these these companies or, or authors. Um, they're just things that that help me. So uh, so just know that all this is coming from a place of uh, just a sincere effort to uh, to help out. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm just really at the end of the day. Just a random guy on YouTube that has some information to share that I, I, I hopeful, uh, I'm hopeful will uh, will help you out. So let me get into um, what I've prepared here. It'll just take me a second to uh, share my screen, and uh, I'll get started here. Um, so this, uh, so this is this is me. Um, this is me at one of the uh, the many periods of my life where the hives were um, totally out of control. Um, these are all from different different points. Um, you can you can see clearly there's uh, you know there's there's quite a few hives there. Um, now it, it, it's important to note, like anybody who's got chronic um, idiopathic urticaria, chronic chronic hives, um, there's no cause. So I, I'm I'm a healthy guy. Um, I don't have any food allergies. I have no health issues. I never have. Um, there was really uh, no reason uh, for for my hives. You can see from the pictures, uh, you know, lots of these these red bumps. Um, what uh, what you can't see from the pictures is the discomfort. Um, each of these bumps feels like I'm going to say something between a mosquito bite and a sunburn. They're they're itchy in a way that you cannot ignore them. And, uh, you know, when you have them uh, like like you see in the pictures here, it just takes over uh, your entire being. Uh, I mean, there's days when you can't even breathe. It's just so, so itchy. Uh, the doctors call it discomfort. And and that word still to this day makes me laugh because it, it's discomfort doesn't even begin to describe uh, what you're going through. So if you've got hives, if you're here because you've got chronic urticaria, uh, my heart just goes out to you. Uh, it's the worst thing ever. And, and nobody understands what you're going through. They, they have no idea how badly you're suffering. Um, you know, this, this condition is completely debilitating. Um, and, and because no one understands what you go, what you're going through, it's, it's also quite isolating and, uh, consequently quite depressing. I would say it, it, it just feels hopeless. There's, there's never, you know any information to work with and and the doctors themselves are are ultimately frustrated with it as well so it's it's a hard place to be uh and uh, if you're suffering from this I, I know how hard it is to just get motivated uh you know to get out of bed in the morning um let alone to push and advocate for your health and, and continue to try new approaches and things so uh you know i i really feel for you um I first saw my uh, my hives way back in 1997 when I was about 24 years old. They very quickly grew out of control. Um, There's no apparent cause, as I mentioned, and I, I probably I think it was five separate doctors I saw uh, before being actually diagnosed with um, chronic uh, urticaria, chronic hives. 
Um, over the decades, I tried every treatment in the book uh, from you know every antihistamine or drug that behaved like antihistamines that, that they have. Uh, I tried Zolaire, um, steroids, I mean, you, you name it, everything. Uh, nothing worked for me, unfortunately. Uh, so I really had to become an advocate for my own health and seek out different doctors with different opinions and different approaches to try. And, and I did a ton of my own research and experimentation as well. Uh, so I'm here to tell you, at least uh, from my experience, there's hope. <laughs> And, uh, and and hopefully uh, I can pass along some of that in the next uh, half hour or so. Um, in the past 24 years, I've seen my hives go from extremely severe, uh, you know, times like you see in the, um, in the photos above, to complete remission. And in fact, I've been in complete remission uh, for extended periods uh, three times over the last uh, 24 years. And I, I feel like I've really got a handle now on what brings me there. And uh, I feel confident that uh, uh, next time they do come back, I'll, I'll be able to just apply the same formula. So I'm in remission now and, uh, and life is sweet. So, um, so hopefully um, there's some information here that, uh, that you can use. So um, in this presentation, I'm, I'm gonna take you through a bit of a framework that really helped me understand and, and kind of break down and tackle the problem. Uh, took me a while to get to this and, and, and it was really super helpful. Um, I'm gonna share some information that just helped me get comfortable so I could get through the days uh, without <laughs> just going bananas. Um, I'm also gonna connect you to some resources uh, for, for research and so forth that, that might help you. Uh, Cause you know, the, the key to this really is uh, researching and, and trying new things and finding what works for you. Um, and then I'll, um, I'll walk you uh, through the specific things that I did and, and that I do essentially to turn off the hives, to cure the hives. And, uh, and hopefully, hopefully there's something in there you can use. Again, not a doctor, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, but uh, these are just personal experiences that, um, that hopefully you can use. Um, so let me get into this. So it took, it took me a long time to figure this out, but I, there's essentially two factors that um, that derive the the hive condition for me. Number one is just the histamine level in my bloodstream, how many histamines are coursing through my body, uh, and how reactive I am at the time. And th these two things work together uh, for me, and I'll, I'll I'll try to explain how this uh, works for me. I'll, I'll tackle them one at a time. So. First off, um, when it comes to histamines, I learned that you know different foods contain different levels of histamine, and some of them contain quite a bit. And it takes a long time once the histamine is in your body for your body to break it down. And it has natural processes that it uses to do that, but it uh, but it takes some time. So uh, if you eat something uh, like a tomato, for example, that uh, brings your histamine levels up. Now, some foods contain a lot of histamines and some foods uh, just trigger the release of histamines. And there's a ton that you can read about that. So I won't get into that, but you, you consume a food that does one of those things and it brings your, your histamine levels up. Um, and then your, you know, your, your histamine levels will be at a certain point. If you eat another food, yeah, uh, alcohol, that's a classic, uh, that'll bring your histamine levels up again. So they'll kind of come up. The, given time, your body will deconstruct the histamine and it'll remove it from your bloodstream and it'll it'll come down. But then, you know, maybe you'll eat a pile of nuts and that'll bring the histamine levels back up again. Maybe you'll hit some cell, some excuse me, shellfish, and that'll bring things, well, in my case, way up. Um, maybe it comes down a little bit and then you you grab a bunch of berries and it brings it up again. And it'll come down over time, but there is a certain amount of, you know, the histamines just adding up inside your system. And it takes a while for them to, to be removed. Now there's supplements that can help remove them. And I'm gonna get into that in a minute. Um, what I found was as long as I was at a point where the histamines in my bloodstream were below my level of reactivity, I was okay, but as soon as my reactivity um, was a little bit more sensitive, then 
I could very easily go above that level and I'd start to get hives. And uh, this for me was a, a really great way to think about hives and really helped me manage them. Uh, during those periods uh, where I was reactive, I, I would really react to foods. And uh, if I wasn't so reactive, then maybe it wouldn't be so bad. And, and this framework really helped me understand why sometimes I would get hives from eating a food and other times I wouldn't. Again, I didn't have any allergies, but it just seemed so random and out of control and hard to manage. Uh, but this, this really helped me zero in. So if my reactivity level was, was okay, you know, I'd be all right. But as, it, as I got more reactive, I would get more and more hives in reaction to foods. And there were times when I would react to literally just anything. If I was really reactive, I'd react to sunlight. You know, um, I'd get hives just if my, my arm was out in the sun. I could literally, well, and I'm sure anybody watching this video who has chronic hives knows this, I could, I could draw hives onto my skin. I could, I could you know, press in, into the meat of my hand and I'd, I'd get a hive from the pressure. Chemicals, you know, uh, suntan lotion even would, would, would give it to me. Um, but if I wasn't reactive, uh, it wouldn't matter. And, uh, and there were, you know, periods where I would kind of come and go. So that spot in between how reactive I was and the amount of histamines coursing through my bloodstream uh, would determine whether or not I was in remission. So I started thinking about it that way. It's, you know, as being, being cured or being in remission is essentially just the gap between how reactive I am and, um, and how many histamines are in my body. And what I discovered was that there are things that I could do to tackle both sides of this equation. So um, how much histamine was in my body and how reactive I, I was or, or I am. Those two things, breaking it down like that and separating them and then going after strategies that tackle both sides um, was a big part. It's not the only part, and I'll get to some other things too, but um, but this made a, a big difference for me in the day-to-day -day management of things. So I'm going to first start uh, by talking about just histamines and what I was able to do or what I discovered that, that helped keep those histamines in check. And then I'll talk about um, how I was able to address the reactivity side of things. So first off, um, with uh, reducing histamines, uh, I didn't have any allergies. So my histamine levels had nothing to do with a reaction to, to foods from an allergy point of view, but certain foods do cause histamine to be released into the body or they just contain a ton of histamines themselves. Um, so when I was reactive, actually removing high histamine foods really brought me a lot of relief, but I had to be super strict about it. So altering the diet to remove high histamine foods and, um, and you know this I needed to be very strict about, and and this is tough. But if but there's a lot of stuff online where you can read about um, if, if you just look up foods for people with histamine intolerance, um, there's uh, there's a lot of information. There's there's a ton of articles out there. I found one particular link that really helped me, and I'll, I'll put this in the comments for the video um, down below. But this link here, this is from uh, a Swiss uh, research group that um, does a, a, bunch of, um, a bunch of research around histamine, and they publish this, this paper, which they keep updated, but it's, a, um, it's basically a list of foods and what kind of level of histamine uh, they have in them. And uh, it's very extensive. It goes on for, for six or seven pages, um, but it, it basically tells you if a food is a histamine liberator, it causes histamine to be released, or if the food itself contains histamine, it'll tell you, you know, what kind of level. Um, so this was awesome uh, as a resource just to figure out what foods to avoid. And, um, and I basically just didn't need any foods. Uh, what, like when I'm trying to wind down the hives, I'll just stay away from foods that contain any histamines uh, whatsoever. And, um, you know, it, it needs to be uh, something for me that, that I do uh, pretty strictly. Uh, the other thing I would say is when it comes to bringing down the hive level, um, progress is measured in weeks, 
not days. And that's where I always used to go wrong in the early days. I'd try something and it wouldn't wouldn't work because it wasn't working fast enough for me. And I just thought it wasn't working. But it takes five days uh, before you see really any um, change, or at least that's the way it was for me. So uh, if I if once I go on to the low histamine diet, it takes four or five days before I really see a difference. But I always do see a difference. So it's easy to get discouraged, but um, but I just, you know, after a couple decades, I've, I've had the benefit of time and I've kind of learned that. Um, alcohol is a special mention. I put it on the slide here because alcohol is weird in, in how I react to it and other people I've talked to in the support groups on Facebook. Um, if I have, I, I, well, I'm from the East Coast of Canada. We, we drink uh, oh, down there. And uh, so it's not unusual to have more than just a couple uh, glasses of wine. Um, if I had more to drink uh, with the hives, typically the next day I would wake up clear. It was like having a steroid shot. Um, but uh, and and so it was very confusing for me. But um, but after that day of relief, the hives would come back and they would come back with a vengeance and they'd be way worse than they ever were at the start. So alcohol was kind of a kind of a tricky one. Um, but uh, but definitely high in histamine. There's actually, uh, in, in my research, uh, there's actually four different ways that alcohol causes hives. So it's definitely something to uh, to avoid completely. Uh, would definitely advise that. <laughs> uh, uh, nightshade vegetables. <clears throat> these are these are sneaky. They a lot of them don't necessarily contain a lot of histamines, but there's something about nightshade vegetables that really aggravate hives. Uh, I don't understand the physiology of it, but it's well documented. You'll see that all over the um, the research papers. Um, again, I've included a little um, uh, note here that uh, gives just a list of what the nightshades are. Uh, there's nightshade fruits and nightshade vegetables, and it applies to some spices too. Uh, but there's not a, not a huge list, so these are pretty easy to avoid. Another big one is foods that are high in salicylates. Um, this again, it's it's well documented. They, they they definitely aggravate hives, and it's a shame because it's it's a lot of healthy foods. Salicylates are basically in peels. Um, you know, like um, it's it's sort of a, a natural toxin that defends plants against bugs and and that sort of thing. Um, but they're pretty common in a lot of healthy foods. Uh, again, I've I've included a little uh, link here uh, with with a list. So these as well, uh, I avoided uh, completely and uh, made a big difference. And in fact, I was going wrong on this one for for years. I was doing the low histamine. Um, avoiding nightshades, but I was missing these guys and they were aggravating me constantly without my knowing it and, and really keeping things going. So it was a big part of winding things down was, was getting rid of these foods. Um, the other thing that I did, um, uh, I, I did a, um, a food intolerance test just to see if there were any foods that I would react to. This is this is based on IgG reactions, and it's controversial. Uh, a lot of a lot of doctors uh, they don't really think that these are are worthwhile, and I don't know. But um, I did this um, test as well and found that there were a few things uh, that I I was showing as intolerant. These are all things that are on the earlier lists anyway. They generally have histamine or they, they have salicylates or whatever. But I did avoid the um, the foods on this list as well, which for me was uh, grains, essentially, dairy, egg whites as well, um, uh, peanuts, almonds. I mean, those are high histamine foods anyway. But uh, but all this basically took me to what I call my my super safe list of foods. And I'm going to share this here, and I'll leave it up on screen if you want to get a, a snapshot of it. These are the, the list of foods that are absolutely safe for, for somebody with uh, with this kind of uh, condition. Now, I would say, before I put this up, this is an extremely limited list of food, and you've got to be so careful when you're limiting your diet in this way. I would talk to a doctor before you take anything uh, like this kind of approach. Um, but, uh, but this is what worked for me. So on the protein side, egg yolk. So you'll hear articles will say don't eat eggs. Egg yolk is completely fine, um, or at least it was for me. Egg whites, where the where the proteins are, that's uh, a little bit more problematic. I I couldn't have those, but egg yolk was great. And so I just separate them, you know, break the shell in half and separate it like you'd do if you were baking. Um, and I ate a lot of egg yolk. Lots of nutrition there. Lots of fat to keep you going. 
um, lamb, um, chicken, if it was skinless, duck, if it was skinless, and turkey, uh, salmon, and trout. Now, there's a couple of asterisks here, and this is so important. Meat has to be absolutely, totally fresh. The um, bacteria that's in meat produces histamine as the meat ages. So you can't have beef, for example, because no beef is sold fresh. It's always aged. A anywhere you get beef in the grocery store, the butcher, no matter how high end or, or, or the, you know, the various high grades of beef, no matter what, it's always aged at least two weeks. So beef for me was rayed out. I, that's another mistake I, I made over the years. Lamb typically uh, makes it to the butcher really quick, but it has to be so, so fresh meat in general. So I found a butcher um, here where I live in Toronto, where they deal with local farms just north of the city. And I found out exactly the days when the lamb and the chicken was coming in. So the, the animal would be slaughtered, it would get right to the butcher and I could buy it literally the next day, sometimes even that evening because the drive is so close. That's how fresh it needs to be. And what I would do is cook it and freeze it. And then in the freezer, it'll keep. So it was, it was convenient. I would buy it like, you know, all at once in one week, cook it all up right away, freeze it, and then I'd take it out of the freezer and eat it. Uh, and that, that worked really great. I've put two asterisks on the salmon and the trout because this has to be super fresh and sushi salmon is not necessarily fresh they they um bring it to a super low temperature to kill the bacteria but that doesn't mean the, the histamine's not there so salmon like uh, i would go for caught uh that morning and and same with trout which is hard to do when you live in toronto but again i found a great uh, fishmonger who was getting salmon uh, from the West Coast that was brought in uh, on the boat in the morning, put on a, an Air Canada cargo jet that he had couriered to him. So in the late afternoon, I could literally buy salmon that um, came off the boat that morning. And again, I'd cook it up right away en masse, freeze it. And, and that's how I, I was able to get that kind of variety of meat into my diet. And you know, salmon uh, in particular is super nutritious. Uh, meat in general just has a lot of nutrients and that uh, that really helped me survive these periods where I needed to get my diet uh, to a point where it was really uh, constrained. Um, these are the uh, the safe vegetables. Uh, so these are the ones that, you know, don't fall into the nightshades family, don't have a lot of salicylates, etc. There's not a lot here, but white onion gives you flavor and um, and you can cook with that. And the rest of them uh, worked very well, and you can you can eat as many of these as 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 you like. Uh, beets, in particular, roasted, very nice. Same with carrots. Um, this is the fruit, so green grapes, pomegranate, etc. I, I had never eaten a persimmon before, uh, but these are these are very tasty. Um, red and golden delicious apples, either one, but they have to be peeled. You got to get those salicylates out. So so peeling. Uh, helps. I also peeled the carrots too. I should have uh, mentioned that. Um, and uh, and then for just starchy carbohydrate, black rice. Um, it'll say glutinous rice on it, but that's just because it's kind of sticky. It's it's completely fine. Um, and it, there's actually been studies that show that um, it reduces um, skin inflammation. Uh, millet is great. Uh, has a different taste to it, but quite enjoyable. It's nice. Uh, so uh, definitely enjoyed that and um, wild rice and just uh, regular rice. And that, that gives you a little bit of filler there. And then um, for flavoring, maple syrup is OK and salt as well. But uh, but this is it. And this is what I would stick to. And I would stick to it super strict. And, and I would um, I, I should also mention, too, I wouldn't there's nothing else on here. Like I wouldn't I wouldn't have I wouldn't fry in olive oil or fry and butter. Um, in fact, when I cooked my chicken, I used to get chicken breasts and uh, I would pour the, the the fat off the chicken into a little ramekin and keep that in the freezer as cooking um, um, cooking oil and, and use that and just keep this diet absolutely pure. And this made a huge difference for my general comfort level. And this is something that if I, if I saw hives on me tomorrow, I would go right to this 
and it would really calm things down and keep me comfortable while I work on the other things that I'll, I'll show you to reduce um, reactivity. Um, also, thankfully, black decaf coffee is okay and stinging nettle tea because you got to have a little a little tea during the day and a little coffee in the morning. Um, but uh, yeah, as, as much as this doesn't look like much fun, <laughs> it's very restrictive. I mean, there's no pepper here. There's no spices. There's nothing. Um, but, um, but for me, this worked and it made me comfortable pretty fast. Um, so that's, um, that's the, uh, the diet side of it. Um, and I did that really for, uh, for months. Um, I think, uh, the last time I flared up really bad, uh, it probably took about four months, uh, doing that diet to really, to really wind down. Uh, the other thing that helped uh, was intermittent fasting. What I would do is just skip breakfast um, and I would save this for really bad times. Um, and uh, and I found I couldn't do it that often without slipping into this sort of stress mode. And uh, this is something that impacts uh, me for sure, is if I get stressed, it really affects the hives. So <laughs> there's a delicate balance there, but I would just skip breakfast and I would just do it once or twice a week, maybe on times where I was really flaring up. Uh, it, it just it just helped. And then uh, on the advice of a naturopath, uh, I introduced a couple of supplements that are specifically used to reduce histamine levels. Uh, quercetin, there's there's lots in the um, the, the research papers around quercetin. it uh, it really helps. Um, and so this is something I, I took regularly. And um, DAO is, a, is an enzyme that your body produces naturally to take apart histamine. You can buy that as a supplement. And what you do is you take it before you eat. And I honestly, I, I, I use that to cheat a little bit. Um, if, I, if I just had had it on the diet and I just needed to have a little piece of cheese or something, uh, I could take a couple of those before I eat. And, uh, and that would help take some of the histamine out of the food. So it didn't really help much with foods that liberated histamine in the bloodstream, but it did help with foods that contained a lot of histamine. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't help with alcohol. If I, I wish if I, if I could have taken that and just enjoyed a glass of wine, it would have been amazing, but it uh, but didn't, didn't work for me. Um, well, and, and shouldn't work. Um, alcohol's just got too many pathways to, to produce hives. But anyway, that really did help. It's super expensive, uh, but um, but something that definitely does does help. And it was nice for me, especially as I got closer to remission, to be able to just break the, break the the diet a, a little bit more often, and uh, you know just accommodate social times and, and things like that. It was very helpful. Um, so that's all the histamine stuff. So. That basically helps control, you know, the the jagged chart that you see there. Keeping that down, all of those things really help to reduce the level of histamines in your bloodstream and essentially give you less to react to. Doesn't matter, you know, if if you're allergic to stuff. I I was not allergic to a single thing, but you know, reducing the histamines in the bloodstream just really helped keep that remission gap big, so that I was comfortable. So the next thing I'll talk about is uh, the reactivity level. Um, this is the other full half of the equation, and this this made a really big difference to everything. So, um, sorry, I'm distracted by noise in the house. Um, so the next thing, um, basically, when it comes to reactivity, um, the the number one thing is um, uh, antihistamines, and your doctor will um, prescribe these uh, right off the bat, I'm sure. Uh, you need to be comfortable, um, and, and antihistamines play a huge role in that. For me, I was lucky. Um, reactin worked for a long time. Just simple off-the-counter uh, reactin um, really helped, and that, that kept, me, kept me comfortable for a while, but the, I did hit a point where it just kind of stopped working. Um, the next histamine, I tried tons, but the, the next histamine that worked for me was Blexton, and it's specifically indicated for hives. It's a very good antihistamine, um, and that one uh, that one kept me in, in remission for, I think it was like three years before it stopped working. Um, it was very good, um, but it did, again, just like the reactant, uh, stop working. Uh, it also um, 
Uh, I should also mention the uh, the nettle leaf. This is a, a natural antihistamine. Um, I use this on the advice of my uh, naturopath who recommended that I steep the tea for a full 30 minutes before drinking it and uh, and have it several times during the day. Uh, three cups a day is what I was doing. And it's actually very good um, as an antihistamine and uh, and nice to have tea, you know, during the day when your diet's, you know, so re restricted. Um, so th these three really helped me. Uh, but I've, I've got a big caveat uh, with antihistamines and that for me, it was really critical to take the minimum effective dose and to wean off the antihistamines as the hives improved. And that is one of the single most important things that uh, I, I need to share. Um, you know, when it, when it comes to hives and antihistamines, there's an interaction there that you need to be careful of. Um, I needed to wean off the histamines or antihistamines to get into remission. And, and it's something that I've seen repeatedly. Uh, antihistamines are not supposed to work that way. They're not addictive or anything like that, but you do need to wean off, or at least I did. And this is something that uh, my doctors always debated. Um, but, you know, in my experience, I needed to I needed to wean off to get to remission. Um, I would say you always need to listen to your doctor, but I am so glad that I got second opinions from other health professionals that led me to that notion of needing to get the body back to its natural state where it wasn't leaning on antihistamines. Um, I, I know for myself that I never would have gotten into remission if I'd stayed on the antihistamines. The, the way it worked for me was I'd, I'd get hives and you know I would be prescribed uh, antihistamines. I'd take those antihistamines and the hives would improve and and that that'd be great but eventually the hives would catch up eventually i i the antihistamines would stop working and uh and i and i'd get hives again and so many times the the medical advice i was i was getting was double the dose it really increased the dose and and to really high levels um of antihistamine so so i would do that i mean i've i've had had hives for over two decades, so I've, you know, I've, 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 I've experimented with all of that. So I've had super high doses, and I, I, so I'd take the the high dose of antihistamine, and what would happen is my hives would, um, they'd improve, um, but very consistently over the years, years they they'd improve slightly, um, or temporarily, and what I found repeatedly was. You know, I wasn't seeing much of an impact, so I'd say, okay, well, it's been a month or whatever. The hives are back to where they used to be. Um, you know, I, I'm going to have to get off. Let, let, let me take the, the antihistamines away. And if I did, if I did reduce the antihistamines back to the level where they were, well, I would get tons of hives. So it's like my hives wouldn't be too bad. I'd take a bunch of bunch more antihistamines to make them better. They'd get a little better. I'd take away the antihistamines and then boom, they just explode. And this happened time and time again. Um, so I, I really came to feel in my experience that there was a connection there. And so I went through a process of slowly weaning off the antihistamines. And what I would do is just without my body noticing, I'd, I'd literally just take like a pair of uh, clippers, like, uh, you know, a clean pair of um, like toenail clippers and just clip little pieces off the pill slowly over time. So, you know, trying to trick my body so it wouldn't even notice. And I'd go, uh, finally I'd get it down to three quarters of a pill and then to a half a pill and then to a quarter of a pill and then to nothing. And every time I reduced it, even a crumb, the hives would flare up and I would feel really panicky, like, oh, I better take that antihistamine, but I'd hold on because I've learned over the years. and. It would flare up, but only for a few days, and then it would settle back down. And that cycle would repeat itself. I'd clip another, maybe a week later or two weeks later, I'd clip another piece off. Uh, so my, high, my, my pill was a little smaller, and I'd flare up for a couple of days. But then slowly, over five days, like takes a while, I would settle back down. And so uh, I, I continued that. So this is a big part of how I get myself into remission. 
I take the antihistamines initially to get comfortable so I can do all the other things I need to do, uh, but then I slowly reduce it. And, uh, and that, um, that really helps. So weaning off the antihistamines, huge factor for me. Uh, and it's something that's just not talked about in any of the, um, uh, you know, the, the, any of the doctor's offices I sat on. I had, to, I had to really get a lot of second opinions and different advice um, to, to come to that, but it really, really worked for me. Uh, next thing as far as improving reactivity was th this idea of an imbalance in T helper cells, Th1 and Th2. And this is, this is something that um, there's more and more being written about right now. And the idea is that um, if, this, uh, if T1 and Th2 get out of, uh, out of balance, it can, uh, it can result in, in conditions like uh, chronic urticaria. Um, and there's a, there's a lot happening uh, on this right now, a lot of research. And, and in fact, uh, one, of, one of the doctors that uh, I was pretty actively involved with, his clinic was actually doing um, uh, just this year, uh, or yeah, I guess it started last year, 2020, um, was doing a clinical trial for a new drug that shows a lot of promise that's actually targeted at uh, reducing TH2 and, and, and correcting uh, that imbalance. So you'll see a lot written about this if you research it. Um, I came across it because of um, a naturopath, uh, Johan Chikara, who's at Absolute Health and Wellness in, in Brant, Ontario. Um, he wrote a couple articles around this, and I put the, uh, the link to that here on the slide, and I'll include that in the comments as well, um, just with some information around that. So I, I talked to him, and he uh, prescribed a bunch of uh, supplements, essentially, to help bring things back into balance. And so in my case, um, uh, this was things meant to increase uh, Th1 and decrease um, Th2. Uh, or maybe it's the other way around. <laughs> Look that up, because <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. This is something you should talk to a naturopath about, of course. Um, but uh, but I thought I think for me it was reducing Th2 and increasing Th1. But these are the supplements that he prescribed. So I took these on a regular basis. Um, I, I believe this was a massive driver of of my improvement overall. Um, taking these supplements really marked uh, you know a, a change in direction. Um, the other thing was gut flora, and uh, I'm sure in the research that uh, anybody who has chronic hives is doing, they're, they're seeing a big connection between uh, gut and hives, just because, what is it, 70, 80 percent of your immune system actually resides in your gut. Um, so there's a lot written about that. All, all of your, well, a lot of your mast cells, you know, that produce histamines are in your gut. So there's, there's undeniably a connection there. Um, it's it's worth looking into. I um, there's a lot of material around resolving hives by you know doing these gut treatments and gut remedies, and I I've tried them all. Um, for me, there wasn't uh, a whole lot there. Uh, you know, there's a lot around leaky gut causing hives, and I you know I I boiled my bone broth and and uh, did all the rest of it, the the aim protocols and stuff, and um, there didn't seem to be much of a connection there for me specifically with leaky gut. Um, but uh, but I did do a um, a stool analysis, and it was it was fairly expensive. It was about six hundred bucks, but it was a comprehensive uh, stool analysis. And what it showed um, was I had lower levels of beneficial bacteria, the good bacteria. I, I uh, that showed up in a few different ways in that test. So I, I definitely had lower levels of good gut bacteria, um, and I had uh, lower, like abnormally low levels of what they call secretory or secretory IgA, which is uh, supposedly uh, your first line of defense in the immune, immune system. It's, it's like right there in the mucous membrane. Um, and that was really, really low. Um, so my naturopath theory was that, uh, you know, perhaps the body is overcompensating with the rest of the immune system because this first line of defense is down. And that's what's uh, contributing anyway to the hives. Um, so that's that's another uh, thing that showed up in the stool sample. And what I did um, after my hives went into remission last time, I had the stool sample from before. I actually uh, went and did the test again to see the difference. And there was a significant uh, difference. So once the hives went into remission, I had uh, all the beneficial gut bacteria back and the secretory IgA uh, back to healthy levels as well. Those were two indicators 
both from before and after that shifted significantly. So, um, uh, you know, stands to reason anyway that uh, they were at least involved in the hives. So, um, so those were two things. And, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, when it comes to gut, there's just such a connection there that it's it's worth exploring. So, um, so that was something that uh, we we also uh, targeted with supplements uh, with the same natural path. And so vitamin A was targeting the, uh, the secretory IgA, uh, trying to get those levels up, and uh, and then some probiotics uh, that you see here. And I also was taking Canabactin. That was for um, a, a, a parasite that was showing in my gut, but um, that parasite was at the it, it was in was showing in the test before my hives went into remission and still showing in the test after my hives were completely gone and and gone for a while. So the uh, the parasite didn't seem to be contributing much. Um, uh, so I probably, you know, if 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 and when the hives come back and I need to go back into these routines again, I probably won't uh, do that particular supplement. But these are the uh, probiotics uh, that I was taking HM F Forte the Saccharo B and the uh, probiota histamine X, which is one that's uh, supposed to actually stimulate uh, antihistamine, natural antihistamine uh, production. Um, so those I did. The other thing was kind of a surprise, uh, contact irritants. Uh, this is this is a factor. Uh, for some people, this is very obvious. Uh, for, for me, it wasn't. Um, but uh, at the recommendation uh, of one of, the, one of the doctors along the way, I had a patch test done. So this is different from a prick test, and I had all of those as well, where they, you know, scratch your arm and put different substances on. I, I had that done at a few different points in my life, um, and it never really showed any allergies. But I did a patch test, and a patch test is different. It tests for a type four sensitivity reaction, um, and it's uh, it's it's for people that might have an, a reaction to things like hair dye or uh, chemicals used in the manufacturing of shoes or, you know, um, preservatives or or chemicals in fragrances or sunscreens or stuff things things that basically you need a, a, a contact a prolonged contact with uh, with the the allergen so i did a patch test and um, i it was it was such that uh you know i did a morning appointment they put these patches all over your back and then they you have to wear them for 48 hours and then you you go back and they test, they take them all off, make some some notes, and then you come back yet again a day later. So they're testing long-term exposure to a chemical directly on your skin. And it turns out that I had a, I have a sensitivity to a chemical called glutarol, which is used in um, in several products. It's kind of a detergent um, and, and used in uh, commercial applications. And so I, I, I thought that was interesting. Uh, didn't seem to show up in much of the stuff I was using, but I was noticing, and when I had this test, I was further along in my remission, and I was noticing that the only hives I was left with, the only ones I was still getting, were kind of on my butt and the back of my legs. And uh, so I, I, I'm a knowledge worker. I sit at my, my desk all day. Um, and so I thought, well, maybe there's something in my detergent that, uh, that might be calling, causing the hives. So I switched to uh, a, a hyperallergenic, you know, eco-friendly kind of soap. Uh, for my, my laundry, and uh, and that started uh, a, a period of pretty rapid uh, improvement. I can't point to it being the, the cause, uh, certainly. Uh, I think for me, there's just who knows what sets me off, but um, uh, but it did it, it did accelerate the pace of my improvement. So uh, so that was great. Uh, so definitely recommend uh, a patch test if you haven't uh, haven't had that done yet. And you know. Uh, just having a hypoallergenic laundry uh, certainly would rule out a lot of irritants anyway. Um, for me, I think uh, the the biggest of, of all of this, and, and and certainly at least it's connected to all of this, is, is mind and stress. Um, there was a point where I realized, you know, this hive thing is something that the body's kind of doing to itself. You know, I, I didn't have any physical triggers. I didn't have any diseases, uh, there was no, really no rhyme or reason for it. So it just really came down to the fact that, you know, this is this is something the body's doing to itself. So I thought, you know, there must be a way to address this uh, in the mind. At least it was worth exploring. So I started looking into that. And uh, and when I was reading about this, I, I, I found out about a guy who was um, doing this talk series about stress and, and, and its connection to, to hives. And he was doing this thing where 
it was um, a case study where he, he there was a fellow who was essentially doing meditation and through meditation raising hives on his skin and i thought that was a real moment for me uh i thought if, if somebody can do that if they can meditate and raise hives on their skin then certainly i can do the opposite and so I, I really started diving into the connection between the mind and the skin. And this was huge in terms of my recovery. Um, I, uh, I was somebody who was living with a lot of stress um, and just always living in my sympathetic nervous system. Uh, you know, just a bit of a, I guess, a bit of an adrenaline junkie with, uh, with work, always putting a ton of stuff on my plate. Um, There's a great stress uh, test that you can do. The home, <clears throat> Holmes Ray stress inventory. If you research that online, you'll you, it's it's all over the place. I put a link to it here. The the uh, the Holmes Ray stress inventory. It's basically a list of questions that you respond to and you your score points. And it's basically things in life that might be stressing you out. You know, so at the top of the list, worth a ton of points is death of a spouse, for example. But even good stuff on there, like holidays, Christmas, that kind of thing, is is on that list, and it gets a score. And Holmes and Ray, in the study that they did, they analyzed a bunch of health records and they discovered that um, if you score on this test between like 50 or 100, 150 and 300 points, that there's a 50% chance, statistically in their sample, there's a 50% chance of some kind of health breakdown happening in the next two years following these stressful events. If you score 300 points or more, there's an 80% chance of health breakdown in the next two years. And this study has been around for ages. This is not, this is not new stuff, but it was new to me and it was boom, like a, a, a real um, eye-opening um, piece of information. So what you really, or what I really needed to do um, coming out of that and just realizing how I was living my life was try to spend more time in the parasympathetic nervous system and just rest and relax. I never really did that. Um, and uh, and when I started doing that, things really started improving. And I would say this was probably the the golden nugget that 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 does it for me. So a couple things that uh, really helped here. this this book, uh, Skin Deep, this is a little hard to find. Um, if you go on Amazon, people are selling it used, uh, so you can find it there. Um, it is full of case studies written by these, these two doctors that um, were doing a lot of research in, in the connection between the brain and the skin. Fascinating book. There's a ton of stuff in here that's just uh, really, really interesting. Um, you know, if you're embarrassed, you blush. If you're, if you're scared, your skin bristles. Like there's, a, there's an undisputable connection between the, not, the mind and the skin. This was, this was great reading and really set me off on the whole notion of maybe maybe there's something I can do with my mind to help with this. Um, I credit a lot of my uh, recovery to being at home during the pandemic, um, uh, working from home and having the flexibility to get out every day and walk in the morning, something I could never do. I think that was huge for, for my stress level, just starting every day with a beautiful walk out, out, outdoors, you know. Um, having the ability to control my time a little bit more, having the extra hours to work and feel like, like I could be more on top of things. Um, all that was huge, I think, for, for my recovery. Um, I also uh, started meditating and, uh, and that's difficult, uh, especially for somebody like me whose mind is always going a million miles an hour. But I started every morning, um, first thing in the morning, uh, doing a meditation. I, I did a specific meditation that was targeted at the hive. So not just um, a mindfulness meditation or, or whatever. This was very specifically targeted at the hives um, and something that I found in, in my research, essentially. Um, but I had to do this with a fresh mind. It had to be first thing in the morning, right after getting up, when the house was quiet and when my brain wasn't distracted with everything from the day. It had to be fresh. And uh, this is what I would go through. I would spend 15 to 20 minutes. And uh, this is a, a meditation that came out of my research, but I figured I'd take the time to share it here because it, it was super helpful for me. I go through 10 cycles of deep breathing. And this is basically just, you know, counting, counting in for five, counting out for seven. There's different techniques 
Um, you can look up box breathing. There's there's a bunch of these, but basically just breathing in super slow and breathing out super slow. This really gets you into that parasympathetic nervous system uh, kind of phase. You know, um, it's really good at stimulating the the vagus nerve, as they say. It's um, it's relaxing. Bottom line. Um, and a great way to come into a meditation, it just calms you down. Um, I'd spend a few minutes, as much as I could do, it probably ended up being about five minutes or so, just clearing my mind. So this is the idea of thinking about nothing. Hardest thing in the world to do, but very possible and you can, you can learn how to do it. Um, and um, I would do that and then I would move into a body scan and essentially what I would do is start at my feet and shift my awareness to my feet um, that's something that you'll you'll learn as you get into meditation, but it's it's the idea of basically just concentrating on that one area of your body until you can almost feel it. And I could feel it. It was like a sensation. And then I'd shift my awareness slowly from my feet to my shins and calves, to my thighs, to my butt, to my back, to my just all the way up. Super relaxing. But as I was doing that, I'm also picturing that body part with clear skin. So the visualization was a huge part of it. Just visualizing perfect, healthy skin. And I would do that intently from the bottom of my feet all the way to the top of my head. And that would take about you know 10 minutes to go through that. And if my mind wandered, I would just go to this, this mantra. And I wouldn't keep it going forever because I kind of found it distracting. But I would just say to myself, my skin is clear. My skin is clear. And I just use that to bring my, my focus back. So I'd do that. And then after I did the body scan, I'd kind of picture myself standing there with perfectly clear skin. Maybe I'd say my, my skin is clear mantra a few times, and that would be it. Super relaxing, but there's something about dialing in your brain to that restorative uh, sense of just having healthy skin that, uh, I don't know, somehow interrupts the cycle. Um, I found I had to be absolutely faithful and do this every morning. And I would find if I dropped out of it, my progress would slow. <laughs> so it was really important. Um, meditation is hard to learn. I read five different books on meditation uh, over the years. The, this one, and maybe this says something about me, but Meditation for Dummies was far and away the best book I read. Uh, really easy read, fun read, uh, and um, just you know makes it makes it easy to wrap your head around what meditation is and how to do it. Uh, the other thing that's fun is the the Muse headband. Now this will cost you a couple hundred bucks, but uh, it's essentially a biofeedback mechanism. So this plays. Uh, you you wear earphones. There's an app that you use, and it will tell you when uh, through an audio signal in your in your earphones, and you can look at a graph of your brain activity afterwards and kind of see when your brain is in that meditative state. So it's great in the early stages when you're first learning how to meditate. It just gives you a bit of uh, reassurance that, yeah, you're in the right state. Uh, because I think that's what's difficult about med about meditation in general. It's, it's hard to know if I'm even doing it right. Um, but, uh, but this is an interesting uh, product. And I didn't use it all the time, but uh, I had fun with it. So um, if you're learning how to meditate, it's definitely, you know, worth, uh, worth you know, trying it out. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, on the meditation vein, I wanted to make sure I was, I was reading about different types of meditation and I wanted variety in my meditation practice to make sure I was covering off all bases. I, another thing that I had I, a lot of success with, funny enough, was hypnotherapy. Hypnotherapy at the end of the day is really just another type of meditation. But what's neat about it is there's another person helping you through it. And uh, most hypnotherapists will record their sessions with you. So I did two different sessions. Um, well, over the years, I've actually done a few, but most recently I did two different sessions. And, um, and the hypnotherapist gave me a recording. And I took that recording and, uh, and listened to it. And I did that every night. Uh, the, the sessions were specifically targeted at the hive. So it was a lot of visualization exercises around you know, again, just picturing my skin clear, uh, reassuring you know me that my health was okay and things were going to improve and things are improving and et cetera. Um, it's essentially just a lot of positive suggestion while you're in a really relaxed state. Um, and it's it's great stuff. Um, you know, there's 
if, if it was all hocus pocus, these places would have gone away years ago. Um, but um, but there's definitely some some effective use there. Um, so what I found great about this was meditation. I had to do it in the morning when my mind was sharp and clear and it was easy to stay focused. At the end of the day, after 12 hours of Zoom calls and all kinds of artificial stress coming from clients and everything else, um, this was the best way to relax because it didn't require much of me. All I had to do was put on my earphones, crawl into bed, that's what I did, get into a, like a nap position and just listen to this thing and kind of fade off. And um, and this worked great. So I, I would listen to this every day. So I was essentially getting two meditation sessions a day. And uh, and this was great. And plus it gave me a great buffer between work and the evening. So it was just really nice to have that little that little gap. So um, so that helped a lot. So that's what I did. Um, so all this took months, but I saw constant small improvements. And there were setback days. There were tons of setback days. And it was hard to keep going. Uh, but the fact that I'd seen small improvements uh, really helped me get back to it. So so now, uh, these days, I, I, I live here. I live in this, this happy zone, this, this gap between my reactivity level and the histamine levels in my body. And I've got strategies for reducing the histamines and I've got strategies for helping out with my reactivity level. So uh, here, yeah. So here, I'll put this on screen. This is basically just a quick summary of everything I did. So this is kind of the sum total. Uh, this is my survival kit, if you will, for when the hives get bad, this is what I do. And three times now, uh, I've been able to get myself into uh, remission, complete remission, no antihistamines, eating whatever I want, drinking lots of red wine, everything um, by doing these things. And uh, so as soon as I see a hive on me, uh, I just go right to these um, things and, uh, and things clear up right away. So uh, I'll put all the, um, the links into the notes so that all those are there. And then um, I would just say, you know, in summary, if I had to hit on one thing on this list that made the biggest difference, it's it's definitely the mind over matter piece. Um, all the other things help and support the situation, uh, but uh, but the biggest thing is is basically controlling that stress, which, you know, probably makes a lot of sense because it's it it's, it drives everything to do with gut and immune system and, and everything else uh, that might be involved. So so that would be, uh, I would say, what helped me the most. Anyway, that's that's it. I've been rambling on for a long time. So if you made it to the end, thanks for your attention. I sincerely hope something in here tweaked for you and, and there's something in here that um, that maybe you can use and and um, and it helps you out. Um, and uh, and if that is the case, then I will be the happiest uh, camper in the world. If you do have any success, maybe you know, shoot me a note in the comments and and uh, and let me know because I would I would love to hear that. So um, good luck. I uh, I hope you can if you have this. I hope you can continue to dig deep and find continued resilience. <clears throat> sorry, resilience to just continue getting through the day. You know, um, there's a there's a great uh, Winston Churchill quote uh, from uh, from the, the the war. If you're um, if you're if you're going through hell, just keep going. And uh, I think that's your your main job when you have something like this. Anyway, good luck. I wish you the best.